Okay, welcome back everyone. Today we're gonna to be talking about leaps, leap options. This is for those of you that are longer term investors. This is one of the few webinar topics that we do geared more so for those of you that are stock investors, especially long-term stock investors. And we wanna show you how leap options is an alternative um, or, or an alternative that you should consider when you're deciding um, whether you want to buy a stock or potentially an option for your long-term uh, bullish or bearish views on an underlying stock. So my name is Tony Zhang. For those of you that are familiar, welcome back. For those of you that are brand new, I am the chief strategist of Options Play, which is a tool that you guys have access to free of charge through First Trade. So really um, looking forward to bringing up this new topic that we traditionally don't talk about because a lot of the option strategies that we bring up is geared more so for short-term active traders. Um, this one is really for those of you that are long-term investors. So we're gonna do a little different style here today. Normally we talk about a strategy first, what it is before we get into when you should use it. So today I'm gonna to actually start off by talking about when you should use options because that's really the context of everything that we're gonna provide here today. We wanna to first define what leap options are for before we get into what they are and how to utilize them because they're very specific types of trading. Uh, then we'll get into what leaps are, um, what are some of the optimal strategies to use when you're trading leaps, and then uh, some trading strategies, meaning what, what kind of tips you should be using um, when you're trading leaps. And then lastly, what I want to cover is what the poor man's cover call. The poor man's cover call is a topic that we've covered before in uh, the webinars that we've done on cover calls uh, very briefly. So today I really want to touch up on how poor man's cover calls a great way to leverage leaps to give you better returns. Um, and then lastly, what we'll do is we'll, we'll actually show you guys some comparisons of buying stock with buying some leaps side by side, uh, not only just uh, comparing stock to leaps, but different types of leaps so that you can really see the difference between the different strategies and show you how to do your own analysis so that when you're looking at a stock that you're bullish on, and you want to compare buying that stock to buying a leap, showing you how you can do it using options play so that you are able to do these analysis yourself with the tools that are available to you at first trade. So I'm going to first start off by talking about when you should use a leap. So there's two types of leaps you can use. You can use calls or puts. So calls is really for those of you that are looking to replace a stock strategy. And what I mean stock strategy means if you're bullish on a stock, what would you do? You'd buy that stock. So when we're considering using leaps, this is really a replacement for potentially buying a stock. It's really used in the context of if you're buying a stock and you're bullish on that stock, over a relatively longer period of time. So at least two to three months out, that is a time frame that you typically want to use leaps for. So if you're bullish on a stock for three months, six months, a year, maybe even longer than that, these are the types of times that you would consider using a leap. And this is also generally great for stocks where you see a lot of downside risks. Um, I think technology stocks are probably a good example of this. Some of these stocks have made huge returns over the last a couple of years. And many times these are stocks that you want to be in because these are the stocks that are actually driving growth in the market. However, a lot of these stocks are trading at very, very rich valuations. If markets were to correct, these are the stocks that tend to correct the fastest. So these are especially stocks with huge downside risk are ones that you should consider looking at leap options instead of potentially buying that stock. On the put side, this is really for those of you that are looking for a hedge on a stock or a portfolio. That's really the only time you would consider using a put leap. It's not really necessarily best for shorting because short-term strategies tend to be more shorter term. You may not necessarily utilize a leap for that. So this is really for those of you that have bearish outlook on an underlying stock or ETF greater than one to two months out. This is where you would use a put leap. So those are the two primary times where you would consider utilizing a leap in your trading. So the question now becomes, what are leap options? So it's actually quite simple. The leap options are really easy to understand. They are basically call and put options where the expirations are greater than nine months. That's it. They're no different than any other one month or weekly call or put options. They're just call or put options uh, that are expiring more than nine months from today. Now, before I get into, you know, trading leap options and optimal strategies, just as a quick um, poll for those of you that are in this room, please type into the chat window, yes, if you own stocks where you may hold on to for more than 
three to six months, please type yes. And if for those of you that are only trading very short-term strategies where you're only holding on to a stock for less than that, please type no. Just so I get a feel for the audience in the room, please type that into the chat window. So pretty much I've gotten all yeses with a couple of no's here. Um, so most of you are long-term. So again, leave options are is for those of you that have long dated bullish views on certain stocks or ETFs. For those of you that have said no, um, leap options may not be the strategy for you. We have plenty of other options for those of you that trade shorter dated strategies. Uh, so please make sure you look at some of the other webinars that are better suited for short term strategies. But again, if you're bull long term bullish on a stock and you want upside exposure, uh, leaps will give you that upside exposure, but give you limited risk. And that's really one of the key reasons why you should consider looking at leaps as a replacement for your stock. And this is really talking about that downside risk, trying to limit that downside risk if the market was to correct or if the stock was to fall, trying to limit that risk. That's really the key reason why you should consider using leaps. On the bearish side, if you're looking for downside exposure or looking to hedge a portfolio, this is where you buy a long put. Same thing as buying short-term calls and puts, but for leaps, this is just longer dated, um, giving you downside exposure and more importantly, limited risk. Because when you're shorting a stock, if you're bearish on a stock, you have unlimited risk. So buying puts is a great alternative to getting that downside exposure, but having limited risk with that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through a quick leap example just to give you a comparison of the two. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to compare buying the stock to buying the leap. So first I'm gonna go through a bullish example. So if let's say you have a stock in mind and you're long-term bullish on the stock, what you want, uh, what defines a leap is the unlimited reward of the leap with limited risk. And that's really, again, one of the key reasons why you should consider taking a leap instead of a stock. Um, so in this example, I'm gonna use stock XYZ trading at $100 just for round numbers for illustrative purposes. I will jump into some real examples later so that we can show, we can go through some real symbols, especially symbols that are trading at very large uh, dollar amounts to show you, you know, an alternative to buying a hundred shares of those stocks. So we're talking about here, stock XYZ, we're bullish on the stock. Traditionally, if you're a stock investor, you buy, you buy the stock. So let's say you buy a hundred shares at a hundred dollars of the stock. Your max reward on this particular case is unlimited because the stock can go to infinity and you'll continue to make every dollar for dollar as the stock goes higher. Your max risk is $100 a share because if you pay $100 for that stock, if it goes to zero, you risk $100. So your max risk here when you buy 100 shares of that stock or if you buy any number of shares is $100 a share. Conversely, what I want to compare that to is buying a call or buying a leap. So in this particular case, I have an example here of buying a January 2020 85 strike call. So a call that's in the money already by about $15. And let's say I pay $25 for that trade. So what this does is just like the stock, it gives me unlimited upside reward if the stock continues to go higher and higher all the way to infinity. However, as you can see, my max risk is $25 per share as opposed to $100 a share. So I'm risking a quarter of the amount to get very similar upside returns. And this is really one of the reasons why we like to use uh, leap options as an alternative to buying the stock. And again, just to reiterate, what we're doing is we're trying to reduce our risk, provide entry to a specific upside exposure at a lower cost, because instead of costing me $100 a share and only cost me $25 a share, so a quarter of the price, reducing my risk, reducing my overall cost to get into the trade, but still maintaining upside exposure, unlimited upside exposure, which is really what you want when you're bullish on an underlying stock. Conversely, let's look at a bearish example. Um, let's say I'm bearish on a stock. Same thing, I want unlimited reward, but at limited risk. Put options give me this type of risk profile. I'm gonna use the same stock XYZ trading at $100. Let's say I'm bearish on the stock and I think it's gonna go down to $70 or $50. If you're a stock trader, traditionally you short the stock. If you're bearish, that's the only strategy you can do as a, as, a, as a stock trader. So let's say you short 100 shares of that stock when it's trading at $100. Your max reward here is $100 per share, meaning if the stock goes down to zero, you can buy back that share for zero and you keep all $100 that you've sold that stock for. However, your risk here is unlimited. And this is really one of the reasons why I rarely advocate for a user to short a stock because of the unlimited risk. I don't think it really makes sense for anyone to ever get into a trade that has unlimited risk. Conversely, I think a much better strategy is to buy a put. 
because put gives you that same downside exposure with limited risk. So here I have an example of buying in January 2020, which is about a year and three months from now. I buy the 115 put. So again, an in the money put, and I'll explain a little bit in the next slide why we buy an in the money put when we're buying leaps. Let's say I pay $25 for that trade. My match reward here is $90. So the difference between the, uh, the strike price minus the premium that I've paid is the max reward that I can receive in this particular, in this particular case, $90, because my break-even price on the put is $90. However, as you can see, my max risk is $25 a share. So instead of risking unlimited amounts of money to take a bearish trade, I can do the same thing, same downside exposure or similar downside exposure rather with a capped amount of risk. So no matter what happens, even if the stock goes to 200 or 300 or 1,000, I'm only risking $25 a share. So again, the reason for buying a leap put really is to cap your risk because when you're shorting a stock, you have unlimited risk while still maintaining your downside exposure. Really important strategy to, to consider if you're looking at a long-term bearish view on an underlying stock or ETF. So now that we've talked about this, let's talk a little bit about some of the benefits and limitations also of leaps. So because so far, I think I've painted a picture that leaps are great. It gives you similar exposure as buying or shorting the stock with limited risk, but there are some downsides or, or limitations rather. So first of all, benefits, you get similar exposure to the stock with limited risk. Very, very important thing. Um, that's really what we're here to do is get that same exposure as buying that stock or shorting the stock but maintaining a limited amount of risk. That's the key thing to success as trader. I work, at, you know, as a strategist working with traders over the last 13 years, you know, the one thing that I've noticed between successful traders and unsuccessful traders is the ability to manage risk. Um, and options really basically help you define your risk or help you manage your risk by limiting that risk. Um, and that's really one of the key areas that I like to utilize options is to help me manage risk. Second of all, the reason that we wanna use leap options uh, for these bull long-term bullish and bearish views is that leap options have very low time decay. They have very little theta because you actually have very low extrinsic value of the option compared to um, shorter dated options. You're paying, uh, you have far smaller amounts of theta as a percentage of the uh, premium that you're paying. So that lower extrinsic value translates to lower time decay. So that's really one of the reasons why we use leap options as an alternative to buying that stock. However, the limitations with leap options is simply that they're not as liquid. Um, they're not as liquid as the front month options. Most of the liquidity is in the first uh, week to, to a couple of months. When you go further out in liquidity, when you go further out in time, they're, they're less liquid, which is why this is not a strategy for those of you that are looking for active trading. You might say that, well, then uh, why don't I use leaps for short-term trading? And the reason for it is because they tend to have wider bid-ask spreads um, and uh, th they are just less liquid and you're going to pay larger costs in terms of getting in and out of those trades. So again, this is not for something that you want to do frequently. This is something that you want to buy and hang on to for a relatively longer period of time. Second thing about leap options is that you don't receive dividends. So if you buy a call, and versus buying a stock. On the stock side, you're going to get paid a dividend. On the call, you do not. So that's one downside as well. And lastly, they're not available on all options. So you might be bullish on a stock long-term, but there may not be leap options that are nine months or greater. You might only find options that go out to six months on certain stocks. Generally speaking, those are really small cap stocks. So and a lot of times when you're trading these small cap stocks, I would advocate that options in general is not worth it is not the right strategy anyway. So I think that that last limitation is not as much of a limitation for many people because you're generally trading these large cap or mega cap names. These are the types of trades that you generally want to use options for anyway. So leap options are available on roughly about 2,500 stocks. So more, a little more than half of the, the available options that you can trade have leap options on stocks and ETFs as well as indices. Leap options, uh, the optimal leap strategy is anything greater than nine months. Longer dated options minimize time decay. So depending on your time horizon, you might choose anywhere from one to two years out on your leap option. 
And in terms of strike prices, this is really why, this is going back to the first example, why we buy in the money leap options. So based on our back testing, what we generally find is that buying in the money strikes, and, and not, just, not just in the money, but fairly deep in the money strikes, anywhere from a 70 to 80 delta option is really where you wanna be when you're trading these leap options because they trade very similar to the stock. And I'll show you a breakdown in the next slide as to why. Um, but these 70 to 80 delta options really mimic that stock while still giving you a fair amount of downside risk protection if the stock really drops or the stock really corrects. And another way to think about this, if you don't necessarily know what the delta of an option is, is simply trying to find a strike that's roughly 20 to 30% of the underlying stock price. So if you have a stock trading at $100, a call option that costs about $20 a share, is 20 to $30 a share is roughly the strike price that you wanna pick if you're not looking at deltas. That's another way to look at that. And that's actually one of the, the ways that I typically pick my options is I don't even have to look for the 70, 80 delta. I usually look for leap options that are anywhere to 20 to 30% of the cost of an underlying share. So let's actually compare buying an in the money versus an out of the money or out of the money leap. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to compare it with buying the stock. And the key here, again, when we're talking about leaps is we want to compare it to buying the stock. Yes, there are certain options that may give you a better payout if the stock really takes off or if the stock doesn't perform very well. However, the goal here, again, is to replace the stock and mimic as close to the stock as possible while limiting your risk. So as you can see here, I have uh, buying 100 shares of the stock at $100 and how that tr trade will perform as the stock either goes down in price or goes higher in price. So I have a $100 stock. If it goes down to 85 or goes down to 50 or if it goes up to 120 or goes up to 150. So as you can see here on the stock price, it's really easy to calculate. It's dollar for dollar. If the stock drops $15, you lose $15. If it drops $50, you lose $50 and so on and so forth. However, as you can see, what I've done here is I've bought an $85 call. So a slightly in the money call that cost me roughly 20% of that cost of buying 100 shares. So instead of risking $100 a trade, $100 a share, I'm now risking only $20 a share by buying this $85 call. So as you can see, the, the risk profile of that, of that deep in the money call mimics very closely to buying the stock. So here when I lose $15 on the stock, I lose $20 on the call. Here, when I break even on the stock, I lose $5 on the, on the call option. If I go up $20 on the stock, I gain $15 on the, on the leap. If this goes up by $50 on the stock, I gain $45 on the, on the leap. And the big difference here is if the stock drops significantly, here I lose $50 on the stock, but I only lose $20 on the leap. And this is really where the, why the in the money leap, in my opinion, provides a better risk profile because it really helps you mimic buying that stock but in a catastrophic loss of the stock moves down 50%, you're limited in the amount of risk that you have. That's for those high flying stocks or stocks that maybe you have a long-term bullish view, but you're also concerned about some, some downside risks versus buying a, uh, an out of the money leap, right? So this is comparing buying out of the money leap. And some people may find that this is a better strategy for them. But as you can see, for the most part, it doesn't really mimic buying the stock because um, it's relatively similar if the stock stays where it is, you have a $5 loss if the stock stays where it is and you actually limit your loss to only $5. And this is really sometimes the attractive piece is that even if the stock goes down $15 or $50, you only lose $5. However, as you can see, even if the stock gains 20%, you're only making a $5 gain. So a very small gain, even if the stock makes a significant move. And if the stock goes up $50, you're making certainly a, a nice percentage gain, but still not very, in my opinion, a very good mimic of the underlying shares. So really what you need is a very large move in the underlying for this out of the money leap to make sense. For all other purposes, yes, you risk less money, but you're really not getting much upside unless the stock really takes off. So that's why, in my opinion, if, if you're bullish on a stock and you wanna try to replace that stock, the in the money leap will give you better risk profile, better uh, exposure similar to the stock while still giving you that downside risk protection to the downside. So now that we've talked about uh, you know, what a leap is, what are the optimal strikes for a leap, why you should pick those strikes versus other strikes, I just want to give you a few tips on trading them. So first of all, because we're talking about a stock replacement strategy, 
the key to trading these leaps is to enter and exit these trades as if you were trading the stock. So you should think of this again as a replacement for the stock. So whenever you would get into that stock trade or whenever you would get exit that stock trade, you should enter and exit your leap trade along with that same methodology. And generally speaking, this is better for non-dividend paying stocks. And last thing, in order to help facilitate providing even further downside risk protection and help generate some additional income is you can sell a poor man's cover call. Now I'll get into that in the next slide, but just going back to trading, entering and exit as if you're trading the stock is think about how you trade stocks today. So for those of you that answered yes to that chat window um, and said that you do have long-term stock positions that you're long, why do you get into those trades and why do you get into those trades at those particular times? Is it based on a technical a signal? Is it based on more fundamental reasons or views? Think about that process and that's how you should enter the trade and think about when you decide to sell your stocks. Do you have a target price in mind? Do you look at analyst ratings to determine uh, where you think the stock should be valued at? Are those when you decide when to get out? Are they based on technical signals? Whatever those methodologies are, I highly recommend you to write them down and put them somewhere where you sit in front of where you trade because that's going to help remind you of when you should get in and when you should get out. Because a lot of times when we're in long-term trades, we tend to forget why we got into a trade. Sometimes we forget what are target prices or why we even own that stock. So by writing these things down or taking notes, it really helps remind you of when to get in and when to get out. Very important thing when you're trading options because time decay, even though it's mitigated when you're trading leaps, is still there. So you don't want to hold on to a trade longer than you need to. So making sure that you have a plan for when to get in and when to get out on your leaps is really important. So Entry strategy, like I said, you want to enter with long-term bullish or bearish outlook, regardless of how you generate that outlook, whether it's fundamental or technical, just write it down. That's going to help remind you why you got into a trade. And same thing as an exit strategy. This is a strategy where you generally want to exit before expiration, either at a gain or a loss, but you generally don't want to hold the lead all the way to expiration because time decay does become a factor as you get closer and closer to expiration. So the longer you hold on to this trade, the more time decay works against you. So make sure that you want, you have an exit strategy before expiration. And if you want to set stop losses on a trade like this, you really want to set them uh, similar to the way you would set a stop loss on the stock. So going back to the example of stock XYZ trading at hundred dollars, if you have a target price of 150, then set a target and set a, a take profit trade when the stock hits 150. And once it hits that 150, get out of the leap. Same thing on the downside. If you have a stop loss on that stock, if you were trading the stock at 75, then set the same stop loss on that. So when the, if the stock goes down to 75, you also exit the, the leap at a loss in this particular case. So making sure that you set these stop losses and limits ahead of time is really important. And the great thing about trading options when you have limited risk is that the stop loss side may not be as critical because you've already had this uh, artificial floor and how far uh, you can lose because the most you can lose on a leap option is how much you've paid for. So with that, what I want to do is talk a little bit about poor man's cover call. This is really very similar to selling cover calls on the stock that you own. But what you can do is you can actually own a leap and sell cover calls against that leap. It's called a covered leap or sometimes better known as a poor man's cover call because if you don't have the money to buy 100 shares of the stock, you might have enough some money to buy a call option or a leap call option. So that's why we call it a poor man's cover call. This is where you want to generally sell short dated roughly one month calls or puts against the leaps that you own. And how you select your expiration and strike prices is the same methodology that you would use if you were selling cover calls. So if you would sell one month calls that are 5% out of the money on a cover call, you would take that same methodology and sell that same one month 5% out of the money covered leap. Now, this is a strategy that's generally more common on the covered call side than on the covered put side. And the reason for this is because moves to the upside tend to be more orderly and slower than moves to the downside. So we generally don't see a lot of put writing on put leaps because usually when you buy a put on a hedge or if you feel that stock's going to move lower, you're usually expecting that move to happen relatively quickly or relatively fast, which means that you're typically not in the leap as long on the put side as you are on the call side, which means that you don't have as much opportunity sell puts against it. And sometimes you're just expecting a quick, fast move, so you don't typically sell options against that. So for those reasons, 
generally speaking, we do see more cover call leaps than we do on the cover put leap side. And the goal here is to really reduce the cost basis of, of, or further reduce the cost basis of the leap that you've paid for. So we talk about that most leaps cost anywhere from 20 to 30% of the underlying cost, which is a significant cost savings. But usually when we're selling cover calls, we're reducing anywhere about three to 10% of the underlying cost of the stock per year when we're selling cover calls on a stock. When you're selling cover calls on a leap, you can reduce that by about 20 to 50% because you're paid so much less on that trade to get into that trade. So that's why we're seeing reductions of anywhere from 20 to 50%. So you can actually reduce the cost of going long a leap from 20% down to maybe 10 or 15%. So this is really why you know covered leaps is a really um, um, interesting way to generate additional income by putting up a small amount of capital, getting that same upside as you do the stock, but being able to also sell cover calls against it. And with respect to covered leaps, you generally want to roll a, a short call on a leap instead of getting the assignment on that on that call. So if you're if you're selling a cover call against the leap and it's above the strike price near expiration, you want to roll that cover call, buy back that cover call sell a new one, you generally don't want to get assigned because if you get assigned on that, that means you have to exercise your long call to deliver that assignment. And that means you're going to lose out on all the extrinsic value of your option immediately. And that's not something you want to do, especially in the early days of a leap. If you have a two-year leap and you're only three months in, you're going to lose a lot of extrinsic value by exercising that call early to deliver those shares. So in order to avoid that, you want to make sure that you roll your cover calls uh, when you're doing that on a covered leap. So with that, that just sums up, uh, you know, what a leap is, why you should use it, the different strikes and expirations that you should consider and how to further reduce your risk by selling covered leaps against it. Let's actually take a look at some real life examples. So for those of you that are brand new to Options Play, welcome. This is a tool that's available to you free of charge at First Trade. You can find it under the trading, the Options Trading tab at First Trade. And there's a button here on the right that says Options Wizard. When you click on that, that's going to launch Options Play. And the reason that we created this platform was to create a new user experience for options trading that's easier to understand compared to just looking at an option chain. So as you can see here, here's an option chain on Google. And I picked up Google because this is a stock that's trading at a very high premium um, or a very high stock level. So I wanted to take a look at comparing buying a stock to buying calls or leaps on Google because buying 100 shares of Google costs you about $111,000 not the amount of money that everyone has. So how do we compare buying a leap to that? So, you know, we realize that when you're looking at an option chain, it's really difficult to determine which uh, call to buy, let alone if you were, if the stock goes up by a certain percentage, how much money do you make? If the stock goes down, how much money do you lose? It's difficult to tell that by looking at an option chain. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at comparing the stock to comparing a leap using options play to make it a lot easier for you to visualize these strategies and really understand how much risk you have at play and how much reward you have. So first what I'm going to do is I'm going to type in Google. I'm going to click on I'm bullish on this particular trade. And that, what that's going to do is going to bring up three bullish strategies. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to modify these strategies to change them to that we look at the January 2020 expirations, which again was about uh, a month, a, a year and three months out. Um, we talked about choosing an expir a strike price that's roughly 20 to 30% of the underlying cost. So the underlying cost to buy 100 shares is $119,000. So roughly um, a, a, a roughly a fifth of that is somewhere around 2,400 or so. So let's say I pick the 1050 strike, which is $24,000, roughly 20% of the underlying shares. Next, what I'm going to do is I'm going to compare that with at the money call or an at the money leap. Because that's the most that's one of the most common questions I get asked is, you know, why would you not buy an at the money leap? It costs even less. So here I have buying a hundred shares of the stock cost me hundred and twenty thousand dollars effectively. Buying a leap option that's in the money by about a uh, hundred and fifty dollars, that cost me twenty-four thousand dollars. And then I have a leap option here that's an at the money that costs fifteen thousand dollars. So Obviously, this, this is the most expensive strategy, second most expensive strategy, third most expensive strategy, or the cheapest strategy. So let's actually see how these strategies perform in different scenarios. So first off, if, if you know, Google uh, Alphabet's at 
uh, roughly $1,200. So let's say we think the stock might hit $1,500 in a year and three months. So if you expect that the stock's gonna go up to 1,500, which is a fairly bullish view on the stock, if you have bought the stock, you make a nice 25% return. If you bought this leap option, you make an 84% return. If you bought this spread here, uh, if you bought the, the at the money leap, you make a $15,000 return or a 94% uh, return. So clearly if the stock makes a big move higher, this at, the, this at the money call will give you a higher return. However, as you can see, if let's say this, this trade doesn't pan out the way you do, which happens quite a bit, um, let's say the stock stays exactly where it is a year and a half from now, roughly at $1,200. Here, as you can see, on the stock, you basically break even if the stock goes up to $1,200. On the call option, even though this call option, this deep in the money call option, costs more money than the cheap option of $24,000 versus $15,000, as you can see, if the stock stays where it is, you actually lose less money. And this is something that's counterintuitive for some people when you're looking at a, a strategy that costs virtually double what it costs an at the money call. But as you can see, when you're buying a deep in the money call, a lot of it is intrinsic value. So meaning that's value that will stay regardless of how much time goes by. It's the extrinsic value that erodes as time goes by. So you're paying a lot less in an extrinsic value when you buy a deep in the money call versus an at the money call. So if the stock stays where it is, you lose basically 100% of your your, your um, cost of the trade when you buy an at the money call, you're losing $15,000 versus if you bought the at the money, you're only losing $9,000. So even though it costs more, you're actually going to get better mimic to buying that stock compared to buying an at the money call. And then conversely, if the stock goes lower, as you can see, if the stock let, takes a plummet, let's say it goes back down to $700. Um, now, I don't necessarily know that I think Google's or Alphabet's going to go down to $700, but in a catastrophic event, if that does happen, as you can see here, if you had bought the stock, you'd lose $50,000. If you bought this call option, this at the money, or I'm sorry, the deep in the money, you lose $24,000, and here you lose $15,000. So this really gives you the tools to put in all the different scenarios that you think is possible for this stock, whether the stock goes higher, whether the stock goes lower, and see exactly what your expected return, what your expected losses are. But generally what you're going to find is that this a deep in the money call that costs roughly 20% of the underlying cost will give you a risk profile similar to buying and selling that stock with a limited amount of risk in the event of a catastrophic move against you. But conversely, if, if you uh, own this Google stock and you bought it for $120,000 versus $24,000, if you look at selling cover calls against it, looking at this October 19th, 12.45 cover calls. And I'm not going to get into how I selected this strike because we have a separate webinar specifically on selling cover call expirations and strike prices. But this is a strike price that's already optimized based on my personal preferences, which is selling shorter dated options. And my risk tolerance is optimal, meaning I'm not too conservative and I'm not too aggressive. This tells me to look at the October 19th, 12.45 cover calls. This generates $610 in premium over the next 24 days. What that means is that that will translate to be um, to roughly about $8,000 or so in premium over one year's time span, if not a closer to about $9,000 in total premium harvested for the year. So if it only cost me $24,000 to get into this trade, if I could re further reduce the cost of my trade by an additional $9,000, that brings my absolute risk from $24,000 down to about $15,000. So very similar to buying an at the money call or at the money leap while still maintaining that same upside exposure to alphabet in this particular case. And that's really why selling cover calls on a, on a leap is actually one of the more, um, uh, is a very popular strategy amongst long-term uh, investors that use leaps instead of buying calls. Um, you can generate quite a bit of yield by that strategy compared to just simply buying the stock and selling cover calls against it. So just, that's just a quick example of how you can utilize options play to quickly find a leap, um, look at which leaps make sense, compare the different types of leaps side by side based on what your outlook on the underlying stock is, maybe even modify the strikes or expirations depending on what your outlook on the underlying stock is, and then figuring out exactly which strategy gives you the best risk reward for your given outlook. 
So next, what I just wanna do is just go through one more example. I'm looking at Apple, but this is not a $120,000 stock. This is a stock that only costs $22,000 to, to buy. I say only uh, in comparison to the Google and Amazon type examples, but $22,000 is still a lot of money to buy 100 shares of something. Um, so let's compare that to buying a leap again. Um, so here, I'm gonna change this again to a January 2020, same year in a three months or so. Uh, so buying 100 shares of the stock costs $22,000. So buying a, uh, roughly, you know, 20% of that is somewhere in the 400, uh, I'm sorry, 4,000, a little over $4,000 range. So let's say I'm looking at the 195s. And as you can see, that cost me $4,300. So roughly a fifth of the cost of buying 100 shares. And then lastly, I'm going to modify the strategy here on the right. Same thing, I'm going to do the same January 2020 expiration but I'm gonna choose an at the money strike. So 220 strike. So let's compare these three here. This cost me 4,300, this cost me 2,800. So first off, right off the bat, you know, Apple's trading at 222. If you're a long-term bullish on this trade over the next year and a half, I would say that you probably expect the stock to move at least to about 250, if not 270 or so. Um, so if you had bought the stock, you make about a 21% return. If you bought the call option or the in the money call option, you make a 72% return. If you bought the out of the money, you make a 73% return. So both strategies, very similar, um, giving you very similar upside at a fraction of the cost of buying 100 shares of the stock. Conversely, what happens if, let's say, the stock makes a move uh, up to 250 uh, but does it in the next six months. This tool also allows you to say what happens if it makes that move by the end of, uh, let's say the end of February, which is roughly three months from now. Whoops. So the stock makes that move to 250 by the end of February, which is probably a more realistic um, outlook that a lot of you may have because it's difficult to say where you think the stock's going to be a year and three months from now, but you may have a better understanding of where you think the stock might be six months from now. And if that's the case, you can really use this tool to model all different outlooks, regardless of what your views are for even a shorter period of time frame. So if you're only bullish on the stock for the next six months, you can still utilize this leap option and compare buying the stock to buying a leap option. So as you can see here, if you expect the stock to make a uh, you know move to 250, a $30 move in the next six months, you can see that this strategy here on the right gives you that highest return. Conversely, what happens if you know six months go by and the stock doesn't move at all? So as you can see here, you'd lose $667, here you lose $629, here you lose $5. So in this particular case, if you're, if you're short-term bullish on this particular trade uh, to about 250, this strategy here on the right gives you very similar upside exposure to owning the stock, uh, a slightly higher return than buying in, in deep in the money trade. And then conversely, if the stock really goes against you, provides you with that limited capital uh, risk profile. So for example, if the stock goes back down to 170, 160, which is where it was just at recently, if it goes down to 180, here you lose $4,200 by buying 100 shares of stock, $3,100 if you bought the deep in the money call, and then only $2,300 if you bought this at the money call. So as you can see clearly, if you're expecting a short-term move, um, perhaps the at the money calls will give you that better return. So it's really difficult to say which one's best all the time. It really depends on what your outlook is. Um, but generally speaking, if your long-term bullish outlook is on a specific trade, we generally find that the deeper in the money call option, because of the fact that you're not paying all in, in extrinsic value, is usually a better uh, mimic, if you will, of the underlying shares compared to buying an at the money. So that's how you would utilize this, this tool to help you identify uh, a leap option strategy and allow you to compare buying a stock to buying a leap. And I think even though I've illustrated two examples where both the leap options made sense, I really want to drive home the point that just because leap options exist does not mean that they're always better for you compared to buying the stock. And chances are you won't know until you put the two side by side. There will be times, and I think I had an example here last week of Amazon, where it doesn't make a lot of sense to buy that leap. You know, that you're probably better off just buying less, a fewer shares of Amazon than buying uh, a leap option. So I, I want to illustrate that just because leap options are there, just because there are benefits in terms of, of giving you limited risk, um, sometimes leap options also do not necessarily make sense either. So here on Amazon, I think this is an example of this where I'm looking at a trade that cost me roughly 20% of the underlying cost. So buying 100 shares of the stock 
costs you $197,000. Buying a LEAP option costs you $40,000, so a fraction of that. However, I think in the example, what I had here was, you know, Amazon's at 1,900. Even if the stock went to 2,300, I was still making a fraction of what I would make if I had bought 100 shares of that stock. So this is really where we found that not in every single case does the leap option make sense. Then the best thing to do is put the two side by side, put in the outlook that you expect the stock to move in, and then see what the expected return is, what the expected losses are if it doesn't go against you, and see if you're comfortable with those risks. That's the only way to really understand whether a leap option makes sense for you compared to buying a stock. And our tool is really designed to make that process as easy and as transparent as possible so that you don't buy a leap option and then figure out how much money you can potentially lose or how much money you can potentially make. We want you to understand those risks and rewards before you get into a trade so that nothing comes as a surprise to you. You know, putting in outlooks both on the upside and downside really helps prepare you for a trade. And that really helps take a lot of the emotions out of the trade of trading because that's really what gets most of us when we're trading is the emotional side of things. We get into a trade, it, it doesn't go in the way that we expect it to. And sometimes we just hang on to trades for too long because we, we don't want to realize that loss. We want to give the opportunity of that stock to turn around. And what happens next? A lot of times you end up losing more money. And a lot of times that comes down to not having a plan ahead of time. So this is really why using the PNL simulator is really important because it allows you to plan for it ahead of time. You know exactly what your potential upsides are, what your potential risks are, and that helps you stick to a plan because you've already, you already know what the best case scenario and worst case scenario already is so that you've already planned for it ahead of time. So that is you know, my presentation, if you will, on looking at how to look at leap options and whether it's a good alternative for you if you're long-term bullish or bearish on an individual stock. So with that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open this up for a Q&A. Um, for those of you that have any questions, please type them into the chat window uh, or the Q&A window, and I'll answer as many questions as I have time for. And just as a quick reminder, again, for those of you that weren't here for this, to access Options Play, which is a free tool available to you here at First Trade, you can find it under the Options Trading tab and under the Options Wizard button on the right-hand corner. That's how you're able to launch Options Play, and it's a free tool for you, so definitely keep that in mind when you're using first trades uh, tools that are available to you. Uh, let's see, I have a couple of questions here. Any questions, please type them into the chat window or the Q&A window. Marcus is asking, the 30% of stock cost for leaps, is it mid-price? So uh, generally speaking on these trades, you're not gonna see a big difference between bid and ask because the amounts are so large. So as you can see, the difference here is 10,245 versus 10,305. So yes, you can use leaps, but bid ask really, it's not gonna move the needle very much because of how much these cost. Um, why call them LEAP options? So LEAP options is an acronym for Long-Term Equity Anticipation Security. It's an acronym. Um, that's why they call them LEAPs. Uh, it's, it's just a gimmick, if you will. Um, but there simply means any single call option or put option that expires more than nine months from now is considered a LEAP. It's just the name. There's no difference between LEAPs and regular calls. Um, it's only the fact that they expire uh, long dated options or options that expire longer than nine months. Uh, Nancy, do I qualify to trade options after attending webinar or do I still have to fill out the options application? Great question. You always have to fill out an options application in order to qualify for trading options. Does options play offer historical options pricing on an individual stock? So no, unfortunately we do not. As far as I know, there's not any companies that provide that on the retail side. Can the strategy of buying deep in the money be applied to equity index indices? Absolutely. That's actually one of the use cases for uh, these leaps is buying uh, um, leaps on indices. So let's say we're looking at the NASDAQ 100 index. Let's say you're bullish long-term on technology, but you see some huge downside risks to the downside and you want to gain upside exposure with limited risk. Um, first of all, you can't buy the index, so you can buy, um, the only thing you can do is you can buy the, um, an ETF. So an index option is exactly the type of strategy that you would typically utilize this type of strategy for. So if, let's say we're looking at a December 2019 strategy, which is, again, a year and three months from now. This is a $750,000 notional contract. So you would probably look for something in the uh, 100000 120000 range. Um, you know, this is the type of index option that you would probably look at, giving you that same upside exposure at the fraction of the cost of buying 
effectively what would be 100 shares, even though you can't buy 100 shares of the index, um, and then allowing you to give, gain that same upside exposure on an index um, that you traditionally wouldn't be able to buy. Is the high and low of the day provided for options on options play? Um, no, that also is not provided. Um, there's, I've actually never really seen that. And the reason for that is because options don't trade actively, or some of them don't, right? So sometimes the high and the low is the same trade every single day. Um, so that's why we generally don't use the high and the low the same way you use stocks, because stocks trade all day long. Options really, you know, many times don't trade at all. So um, that's why a lot of times you don't have any last sale or high or open or low um, because they just simply don't trade as often. Looks like I have one last question. Um, recommendation on what to pay on leaps when the bid and the ask is a large spread. So we generally find that, you know, if you place an, uh, an order about 20 to 25% away from the mid price to the bid or ask price, that's usually a good place where you can potentially get filled at. That's a general rule of thumb. But generally speaking on leaps, um, the bid ask spread is a very, very small percentage. So here, as you can see, the difference between the bid and the ask price is a thousand dollars, but from a percentage standpoint, it's very, very small. So you're not going to have necessarily a lot of wiggle room there between the bid ask spread. Um, if you're looking at a leap that has a very large bid ask spread, that might be an indication that that leap is not one that you want to trade. So um, keep that in mind. So with that, I want to thank everyone for taking the time out this afternoon. I hope you guys have found this useful, and I'll see you guys in two weeks from now. Um, uh, on that Wednesday, and we're going to start doing uh, webinars every two weeks, every other Wednesday. So I'll see you guys there, and I hope you guys all have a great afternoon.